Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV, and today we're talking with Dr. Richard Rue. Dr. Rue is an orthopedic surgeon who specializes in sports medicine, and today we're going to be talking about sports medicine as well as his approach to total knee replacement in 2014. So thanks for joining us, Dr. Rue. Thanks for having me. Dr. Rue, first give us a little background about how you, um, are, are, how you got to where you are today. Your, your training in medical uh, training, and your training uh, in orthopedics, and now where do you practice? So I went to uh, college at Stanford University and medical school at the University of California, San Diego. And then I did an orthopedic residency in the Harvard Combined Program at Harvard University and the Harvard Affiliated Hospitals. And I stayed there for a fellowship in arthroscopy and sports medicine, also at Harvard and Mass General Hospital. So my practice really has an emphasis on knee and shoulder uh, surgery um, and, and a high volume of knees. Um, today we're talking about uh, total knee replacement and my practice uh, has an emphasis on doing minimally invasive knee replacement. We use computer navigation because we think it helps uh, in a number of ways, uh, both in terms of being able to do minimally invasive surgery and getting very excellent uh, component alignment. So I practice in Yakima, Washington uh, with Orthopedics Northwest and we're a 12 member orthopedic group uh, with also 12 other mid-level providers. And uh, we're very subspecialized and my area of specialty is knee and shoulder. Well, can, can you give me a little bit of history about the, the whole evolution towards minimally invasive uh, history in terms of total knee replacements? Because, you know, this is an operation that's been around, what, 30, 40 years now. Uh, used to require a huge incision, lots of blood loss, usually required us to give blood transfusions after surgery. It was a big operation. And today it's just gotten to the point to where, I mean, we're in a conference today talking about doing knee replacements as an outpatient. Tell me a little bit about your sort of history with this procedure. So my, my history with doing total knees, and, and I've always done a relatively high volume of them for the last 24 years in Yakima, averaging about 100 a year, so now over 2,500 uh, total joints. And I was in the era where we had bigger incisions and in more invasive surgery where we did have blood loss and, and longer hospital stays. 25 years ago, it was not unusual for a patient to be in the hospital three to five days after a total knee. And that's getting shorter and shorter uh, for a number of reasons. Um, one, one big reason is the patients are, are very interested, and we as physicians are very interested in rapid mobilization after surgery for the simple reason that patients do better. We get their joints moving um, quicker. So now about 50% of my uh, patients are what we call 23 hour stay. They go home on the day following surgery. So it's a small jump to look at doing outpatient surgery. And I think with total knee surgery, we're, we're where we were with ACL surgery 25 years ago. 25 years ago, with an ACL, the patient would stay in the hospital one to three days following the surgery. And now, and for 15 years, I've done all my ACLs as outpatients. You might ask, what's the advantage of considering doing an outpatient surgery or a short stay surgery? And there are many. One, when you're in the hospital, even though you have some rehab opportunities, you have everything done for you. Um, and we want to mobilize people, get them back. We think it decreases their uh, perioperative risks like blood clots uh, to be mobilized quicker. And in the hospital environment, if you do pick up an infection, they can be more serious infections. So we do have some motivation there to get people out of the uh, institutional environment. Plus we found that with our more rapid rehab uh, protocol, our patients are doing better earlier and are using less pain medication. So one of your first questions is why MIS? Why minimally invasive surgery? And less blood loss, less pain, able to get into these rapid uh, protocols 
and overall our results are better, partly because of those um, rapid rehabilitation and the small incisions, and because we're getting really excellent alignment using the computer navigation as an adjunct. Well, let's talk a little bit about the computer-assisted navigation because I'm, I'm not certain a lot of patients understand that's probably not something that they would necessarily see during their surgery or anything like that. But can you sort of describe what computer-assisted navigation in, in reference to a total knee is all about? Yes, I can. When we're doing the, the computer navigation, we like to have a um, fairly straight mechanical axis, the, the, the line formed between the center of the hip, the center of the knee, and the center of the ankle. And computer navigation really allows us to know where the center of the hip, the center of the knee, and the center of the ankle is all the time uh, with real-time feedback during surgery. And what we do to get that information is we put pins in the femur and pins in the tibia, and we mount light-emitting diodes on the pins. We have a camera that records their feedback. So the way I think of it, it's like having little tiny GPS units on the femur and the tibia. And, and the way we enter the data into the computer, it really allows us all the time, real-time, immediate feedback, know where the center of the hip is, know where the center of the knee is and the center of the ankle is. And if you look at our data, when we get done, we want to have a zero degree mechanical axis, and we're always within about three degrees of uh, really what we consider perfect alignment. So that allows you to actually see what you're doing without making big incisions. I mean, in the old days, we used to have to right. open up and look at the bone to see that to some degree. Right, in the old days, we used to use either external or internal guides that were really quite rudimentary uh, the way that we mounted them. If you used an external guide, they tended to not be quite as accurate. And if you used guides that recall, required making a hole in the bone and putting the rod inside the uh, bone, they were associated with certain complications including fat emboli and blood clots. So we're getting a much more accurate reading of our mechanical axis, of our alignment, than we got either with intramedullary rods or externally mounted uh, alignment devices. And because we have that accurate information, we can use much smaller incisions. With, with the other devices, you needed more exposure to get those guides in position to give you the information that you needed whereas with the uh, computer navigation, we are able to go with much smaller incisions. Well, and let me go back. You, you had mentioned that, that now you're doing most of your surgeries, and, and I'm assuming we're talking about artificial knee replacements. Yes. Doing those, and the patient stays in the hospital roughly 23 hours. I'd say about 50%. About we, 50%. we have older patients or patients with significant medical comorbidities, that stay longer. So our range is from one to three days. But even if you look a year or two ago, it was between two and three days, and now it's well under two days, and, and really the majority of patients are going home the day after surgery. And are you looking at, at trying to, to convert completely to outpatient to where these patients actually go home the same day? I wouldn't uh, convert my practice completely there, but I would see that there's a lot of patients that would be amenable to an outpatient uh, environment. And what we're doing in our office is setting up an educational process because it's really important to educate the patient about what they need to do afterwards. So that educational process has made outpatient surgery possible. Minimally invasive surgery with less blood loss has made uh, outpatient surgery um, possible in computer navigation with really the excellent alignment and the ability to get good range of motion early with immediate full weight bearing has also uh, made that possible. You know, one of the things that I think patients tend to be anxious about, whether they're going home the same day of surgery or day one or even whether they're staying in the hospital, and that's pain control. Right. So pain control seems to be the one barrier that we used to see as sending patients home. You know, we, we kept them in the hospital to sort of monitor their blood loss and that sort of stuff, but we kept them in the hospital so that we could use 
IV medications, very strong narcotic medications to actually control their pain. And we used to think that that was required for a week or so. Um, tell me about how we're doing that today. How are we controlling pain so that patients feel comfortable at home? We're much better at pain control than when we relied primarily and almost exclusively on narcotics. Narcotics are important and we still use them, but they're not even the most important part of pain control. So this term multimodal pain control is exactly that. Instead of using just narcotics, we use other type of medications. Um, and part of the educational process is, is to let patients know how to take those and why to take those. So medications that we use with the narcotic pain medicines are things like Tylenol, which blocks pain in a different way. We also use other non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, specifically those that are prostaglandin blockers that help control um, pain. Plus we use uh, medications that have been used for nerve pain in the past um, because they can calm down the nerves and you get less of a, a response. We start those medications before surgery. So a day or two before surgery, we have some of the patients taking what I call nerve blocking medications and anti-inflammatory medications. Um, we also uh, control bleeding better than we ever did before. And we do that with excellent hemostasis during the operation, but also by using medications that help control bleeding before, during, and after the surgery. And if you get less bleeding, you get less pain, you get less swelling, um, and that's been very effective. So multimodal pain control is exactly that. Instead of just looking at narcotic type of pain relief, we use a lot of pain blockers and inflammation type of medications that control inflammation. Well, and I think you've already alluded to the fact that minimally invasive means you have less soft tissue that's been damaged so that you, you actually have less of a pain generator. And I think you also alluded uh, earlier to the, to the notion that, quite frankly, if you lay in bed in the hospital, you're gonna have more pain. If you get up moving at home, your anxiety's low, you're, you're in control, you're moving in a normal environment, so you, you're probably gonna have less pain just from a psychological standpoint. I think that, that that's really true, and we've, we've really learned a lot during the, this newer rapid rehab phase over the last um, several years that sometimes patients are afraid of, of using their joint, but they quickly find that using it results in less pain rather than more pain. Now we have to do that in a controlled manner. You can overdo it and, and cause more swelling than you want to, um, but if you follow the rapid rehab protocols, and you use the multimodal pharmaceutical type of things as well as old-fashioned things like icing and compression dressings and things like that, that we can really control the, the pain well and um, patients are, are not frightened by it and I think some of the happiest patients I have are some of these that we've mobilized the quickest. Well, are, are there any downsides to sending patients home earlier? Do you see any patients that you feel like are at risk and this is not appropriate for? Or, or do you think that there are some things that we're increasing the risk for patients by taking this approach? Well, if say for instance you had an uh, elderly patient that had an element of dementia, they're not going to be appropriate for this type of uh, uh, rapid um, discharge. We would keep them in a hospital environment a little bit longer and, and work with them on their rehabilitation. There are certain medical comorbidities that we need to watch in the hospital like coronary artery disease or sleep apnea and, and things um, like that. There are many potential comorbidities where we're not really watching them in the hospital because of their knee replacement. We're watching them to control things related to their other medical um, problems. So yeah, there, there is definitely an element of the population that would not be amenable to uh, an outpatient procedure. Um, but even in those uh, groups of patients, we have found that the rapid rehabilitation produces a better result um, and, and really a more happy patient. And even if we are keeping them in, in the hospital to control their medical comorbidities, 
the concept of, of the rapid early mobilization, the rapid early rehabilitation has been positive for everyone. Well, can you sort of describe this rehabilitation uh, that, that you're currently using for your total knee replacements? Let, let's take a normal patient that doesn't have any significant comorbidities, maybe a, you know, an early um, 60s kind of guy that needs an artificial knee replacement in relatively good health. What should that patient expect after they leave the hospital on that 23rd hour in terms of using a, a walker or crutches, how long they're going to take pain medications, um, what they need to do in terms of uh, help at home, and then sort of when do they get back to, to their normal activity and how much of a role does physical therapy play in that? I think physical therapy is, is really important. And with our patients, we do a preoperative physical therapy evaluation. And, and the physical therapist has an opportunity to talk to that patient about what sort of exercises they'll be doing afterwards. Um, it, it, and it has two very positive effects. One, the patient is educated and they know what to do. And then two, we have an immediate feedback about some things that may make that patient not a candidate for going home immediately. So we know what their rehabilitation uh, limitations are, are going to be. When you leave the hospital, do you normally have patients on crutches or on a walker? Yeah, we, we, with our rapid rehabilitation now with a total knee patient, depending on what anesthesia they've had, if general anesthetic is a little bit different than regional anesthetic blocks, which is a little bit different than spinal anesthetic. So there are some variations there, depending on the neurologic function of their legs immediately after surgery. But now, when they get back to the floor from the recovery room, we immediately get them sitting up, and if capable, they're standing on that first day. Um, and we'll get them on the walker, and they'll have the ability, if they need to, immediately after surgery, to get on the walker and say, go to the bathroom. Um, and so we mobilize them there. We get them immediately doing exercises, such as quad sets and straight leg raises, um, to mobilize the, and get the muscles in their leg functioning. And we'll put them on a continuous passive motion machine that gets that knee moving passively. And they're immediately started on range of motion exercises the day of surgery. Um, we do put our um, patients on a walker for safety uh, reasons, so that if they were to have some sort of unusual event, um, they have less of a risk of falling. But we allow for immediate weight bearing. And we will mobilize them out of the walker as soon as they can walk without a limp. And we have some patients that that happens immediately after surgery or within one to three days. And we have other patients that are on a walker for two weeks. But almost all of our patients now are off the walker before two weeks, and many of them within days of their initial surgery. And when do you begin to let them do activities like driving, for example, or go back to work if they need to? One, it, it clearly depends on what type of work that they do and how physically demanding um, their, their work is. Um, but for instance, uh, I've done some physician friends uh, fairly recently that were back in their practices, you know, seven, eight days after a total knee replacement. Um, so some people are getting back to, to work quite quickly. Now, if you're a... Um, linemen for the county climbing up and down telephone poles. It's going to take you a little bit longer to get there. In terms of driving, we, we have a protocol that we give uh, patients afterwards. Depends a little bit on whether it's right knee or left knee uh, and whether they have a clutch automobile or a standard transmission um, automobile. And they have to be off pain medicines. They have to be off all those types of medicines that can alter their sensorium. But we're getting people um, back to driving, you know, in some cases, within a week when they have good quad control and they can control their lower extremities, and many within two to four weeks. And as patients get better, I I'm assuming that, that you feel like that, that this approach has allowed you to actually get better outcomes a year later. So you're seeing better results 
overall from your knee replacements? I am. I, I think that getting aggressive with that motion early, that we're getting better overall motion, it's a little bit um, hard to figure out sometimes, too, because in the last several years, there's been some design changes in total knees that allow for a little bit more uh, motion. But with the rapid rehab protocols, we do feel that they're getting better motion and better results. Plus, it seems if you get your muscles functioning earlier, um, that you just get a better overall result and you return to normal strength and normal function sooner. Well, I'm going to put you on the spot here and, and, and have you predict the future. I mean, you've seen a, a lot of evolution with total knee replacement up to this point. What's the next five years going to give us? What are we going to see in the next five years? Well, I, I think that uh, for two reasons. One, very, very good outcomes with uh, short stays. And two, with uh, cost of medicine being significant uh, in the country, that there'll be a lot of motivation to consider outpatient um, total joint surgery. Like I, I think I alluded to earlier, I think with total knee surgery right now, we're where we were with ACL surgery 25 years ago. And my guess is definitely within the next five years, and I actually believe in the next two years, that you'll probably see up to 50% of uh, total knee replacement being done as an outpatient. And then those patients with medical comorbidities um, or that don't have a supportive home environment will be in the hospital a little bit longer, two or three days. Well, that's, that's exciting to see that, uh, that sort of evolution occur. It really is. It really is. It's As we close this discussion, which has, has been, I think, a, a fascinating discussion, do, do you think there's anything that patients need to know that might be watching this that we haven't covered about the the the, the state-of-the-art with total knee replacement in 2014? Well, what they need to, to know is that, A, a lot of stuff is happening, and, and that this multimodal pain control has really changed the paradigm. It, it makes patients able to get better quicker. Um, and with that excellent pain relief, they're, they're motivated and able to function quicker, and they really like that. Um, with with the computer navigation we're also we're just getting better alignment and um, I think that with better alignment uh, we're gonna have a more long-lasting prosthesis because the forces are distributed more evenly over that prosthesis also with the uh, minimally invasive techniques we get less bleeding less swelling um, and it allows us to get people back to function much quicker um, the prostheses are getting better, the, the plastic weight-bearing surfaces are better, the cement is better, and we understand how it works better for those prostheses that are cemented. And for those prostheses that have bone that grows into the prosthesis, um, we have different porosities of metal that are allowing that to happen um, faster. So I just think that we're going to see a lot of change over the next five years and really over the next uh, two years with knee replacement surgery. Not so much with the prosthesis in, but how we control their pain, how we rehab them, and how long we keep them in an institutional environment. And then the thing that I would add to that is one thing I've noticed with this, as physicians, we're, we're teachers. You know, we have to teach our patients what to expect afterwards. And I th think looking at this it's made us better teachers because we have to have a program where we make the patient understand what to expect after surgery and why we're using the medications um, that we use for instance we have a checklist that we, we want to make sure that we've gone through all the correct steps before and after um, surgery and now we're starting to use those uh, checklists for the patients so that they remember to do the correct exercise the correct rehabilitation and take the correct medications after surgery. Well, it's an exciting time. I hope to talk to you later about this as well. I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk. Well, thanks for joining us today.